Hello, Politics Plus Media 101 listeners. Today's show is going to be a great one. We have a guest in Aaron Rupar, who is publisher of the Public Notice Substack, which comes out four times a week. Definitely recommend you subscribe. John and I are going to have a free-flowing conversation with Aaron, and we have no shortage of topics. We have a decision out of Colorado Supreme Court regarding the 14th Amendment and Trump's eligibility to be on the primary ballot. We have a GOP primary, which is gearing up for Iowa and New Hampshire. As always, we have a crazy political media environment, and we have some new poll numbers regarding Trump and Biden. So first off, Aaron, thank you for coming in, and how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I think uh, this is the second time I've been on your show, and the last time was probably like a year and a half ago. So uh, we've talked a little bit since then, but it's, it's good to see you guys, and thanks for having me on. This is supposed to be the slow news season. But like Justin said, we've got all sorts of things going on right now. I'm not sure that if the the writers, as they say, the gods of uh, political media would have scripted this decision from Colorado coming a few days before Christmas when people are distracted with uh, their shopping and you know watching their favorite movies and hanging out with their family. But that's what happens. Well, I was surprised, first of all. This 14th Amendment stuff has kind of been percolating uh, for months you know, across a range of states and Colorado is the first state where the, the the case for removing Trump from the primary ballot has been successful. Um, and there have been even, you know, more blue states such as Minnesota, where I'm located, where uh, it was taken up by a court here and rejected. And, um, you know, the crux of it is the 14th Amendment has a clause specifying that anyone who engages in insurrection against the U.S. government is barred from office. And so, it almost seems like that part of the amendment was kind of written uh, for Trump, you know, like one of the uh, the writers of that amendment traveled forward in time and, um, you know, kind of wrote this clause. Of course, at the time when it was written, it was right after the Civil War. And the idea was to prevent uh, former Confederate officials um, from serving in government. Now, it's very likely that the Supreme Court will end up taking this up. And uh, one of the ironies of this whole situation, and actually we'll get into this in a post that will publish uh, tomorrow on my newsletter. But Neil Gorsuch played a key role authoring a majority opinion about a decade ago in a similar case that came up in Colorado, I believe, involving someone who wanted to run for office um, who is not a citizen of the U.S. And uh, Gorsuch authored the opinion ruling that this person was ineligible to serve. And he's actually quoted in the majority opinion that came from the Colorado Supreme Court. So that will be interesting to see. Um, the circumstances are a little bit different, so I guess I could foresee Gorsuch, Gorsuch kind of splitting hairs and, in the Trump case, allowing Trump to run, whereas in his previous case, um, he barred the prospective candidate from running. But that will be one of the interesting interesting things to watch is to see how Neil Gorsuch handles this, given that um, he's cited in the Colorado Supreme Court case making the case for Trump to be uh, banned from the ballot. Yeah, I know that when a lot of plaintiffs have approached the Roberts court, they've designed their briefing specifically for Gorsuch because he has often been somewhat persuadable to rhetorical arguments, and he's known for being this textualist. And that if you give the right analysis of the text and you really play to his kind of biases and his methods of interpretation, you can sometimes win over his vote, and that is the whole prize. A little bit less now, now that it's a six to three Republican to Democrat appointed, but certainly in the days when it was five to four and Gorsuch was vote number five. What you're talking about, Aaron, is I think a case that raised questions about some of the other eligibility criteria for the presidency, that you have to be 35 years or older, that you have to be a citizen at birth. Um, And this is really just another eligibility criteria, isn't it? That you can't be an insurrectionist. And those eligibility criteria were written at different times. This one was written in the 14th Amendment in 1868, but it's an eligibility criteria like the other ones. And there's been a bit of discussion in the wake of this decision that the court is stepping in the way of the voters and the court is taking the decision away from the voters. Of course, we have to acknowledge that the voters have had the opportunity to weigh in on whether Trump should be president. They said no. He tried to defy the will of the voters, and that's why we're in this situation in the first place. But to the question of future voter decisions and whether this is limiting future voter decisions, we should think about how the Constitution does limit voter decisions. It says that voters can't elect 
someone who wasn't a citizen at birth as president and says that voters can elect someone who's under 35 years old as president. And it says that voters can't elect an insurrectionist as president, even if they want to. And I think that when the amendment was written in 1868, the context was about overruling decisions that voters were making at the time. After the U.S. Civil War ended, voters in Southern states were electing people who had fought against the U.S. in the U.S. Civil War to the U.S. Senate, to the U.S. House of Representatives. The voters had these people on the ballot and they were electing them. At the time, none of them had been convicted of crimes. There were even amnesties that prevented them from being convicted of crimes around the insurrection and rebellion that they engaged in. And they were sent to Washington, D.C., and Congress said, we're, we're not going to seat these people. They fought a war against us, the United States, and we can't have them here in the halls of Congress. And the amendment was written specifically to prevent voters from even having the choice of making that decision. So that's really what we're trying to interpret here, whether that criteria um, might be fulfilled by Trump. And I guess the real question is probably about whether what Trump did uh, rises to the level of insurrection that would thus make him ineligible. But there isn't really a question of whether he qualified by that criteria, he would be eligible. Because again, the Constitution says that voters don't even have the choice. Yeah, you you have seen some squeamishness even from uh, liberals. I saw you know Jonathan Chait last night uh, making the point on Twitter that uh, you're basically saying that this sets kind of a, a troubling precedent in terms of the anti-democratic nature of it in the sense that... Um, you know, next time, what if uh, what if a Republican wants to say that, you know, someone like Biden hasn't um, has, has committed insurrection by not securing the border or something like that? I mean, you can see this like we're seeing with impeachment right now become very um, kind of cheapened in a way and used as sort of a political attack against someone. But then, I, you know, again, I would circle back to the point earlier where when, when you read the plain text of this constitutional amendment, I mean, it almost seems like it was written for Trump. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at a certain point, you just have to stand up for the Constitution and kind of let the chips fall where they may. And so actually, you know, I commend uh, the Colorado Supreme Court for taking the step. And um, I don't think ultimately that, you know, my, my strong hunch is that I, I could not really, even though the Supreme Court has handed Trump some losses, uh, even since he's left office, um, I'd have a hard time seeing them upholding this and um, kind of it's setting a precedent that might involve him, you know, possibly being removed from the ballot in states like Michigan, where there's already been an effort there using the 14th Amendment to get him off the primary ballot that's been rejected, but that has not been taken up by the state Supreme Court there. So it's still possible there could be another case, um, you know, it could have a different result. But I guess I have a hard time imagining that happening. Uh, maybe I'm just not imaginative enough. And maybe people like Gorsuch and Roberts uh, will, you know, in, in their own turn, stand up for the Constitution. But I still uh, have a little bit of trouble for seeing that. If that's the assumption that we're making and we're assuming that the GOP Supreme Court justices are going to act on tribalism, on partisanship, as opposed to an honest reading of the law, which, again, I'm not a legal expert. I don't know what the honest reading of the law is. It seems pretty clear, cut and dry to a layman like me that he committed insurrection. And if you commit or participate in insurrection, then you're ineligible based on this uh, 14th Amendment. So if we just assume that they're acting in um, bad faith or not putting the law first in determining what their decision will be, their ruling will be, doesn't it give it credence to the GOP commentators, the GOP politicians that are arguing Democrats better be careful because this opens up a slippery slope in that? I saw a comment from Eric Erickson. He says, Democrats are opening up a can of worms. You need to be very careful. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, he he claims funded BLM, uh, you know, uh, rioters, which in reality was, I believe, helping people get bailed out of prison for protesting around the George Floyd murder by uh, the police officer Derek Chauvin. But if we're assuming that the court system is so rotten that they're not going to interpret this earnestly, is there not a legitimate case that? by having a state attempt to go down this road, that in the future, the GOP could attempt to do this. And if they control the courts, it could legitimately open up a slippery slope. I'm not super worried about that for the simple reason that Republicans are kind of already doing this anyway, right? I mean, they're going to do that one way or the other. Um, they might not try to use the 14th Amendment to remove people from ballots. But I mean, they're, you know, they're gerrymandering, they're suppressing votes, they've already tried, um, you know, they attempted a coup of sorts after the 2020 election. So 
I don't think that's a good way to kind of live your life um, politically, kind of being worried about what right wing, you know, w- what the right wing is going to do in situations like this, because they're going to do what they do no matter what. And uh, again, I think for for people who are approaching this in good faith, um, you know, even saw people like Chip Roy and uh, Bill Barr on CNN today um, disagreeing with the Colorado Supreme Court ruling, but, you know, kind of taking it on its merits and engaging with it, um, because it, it is a legitimate legal question. And again, I think when, when you read the actual uh, text in question here, I mean, it, there is there are real questions surrounding it. It's not like some sort of partisan hit job here. First of all, it's out of our hands anyway, because this is a matter for the courts. It's not, you know, th- these aren't political actors making these choices right now. But secondly, even if it was kind of a, a political thing, you know, like impeachment or something like that, um, I think if you live your life politically worried about right wing backlash or what, you know, mega Republicans are going to do, you know, they're going to end up trampling all over you because they're always willing. You know, you give them an inch, they're going to take a few feet. Yeah, I tend to agree with Aaron because the way I see it, the courts are available to Republicans if they want to try to question the eligibility of any candidate on the ballot in regards to this criteria. If there is a candidate that they believe has engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States, they are absolutely welcome to challenge that in court. We can think about the post-2020 election litigation. The crimes that Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, Mark Meadows, and the others committed were not in trying to use the legal system through lawsuits to alter the outcome of the election. They were free to attempt that. They put forward their challenges, and their challenges lost in court. The courts are available to them to make those claims and challenges. Uh, What got them in trouble legally was when they started trying to defraud the state of Georgia and the United States as they were counting the electoral votes and so on. That's where they crossed the line. The courts are available for frivolous challenges. Um, Sometimes you can be disciplined by the court if it's a completely frivolous challenge, but uh, they're absolutely welcome to challenge eligibility under this criteria. And I certainly hope that if a candidate on the Democratic side did engage in something that could be legally considered insurrection or rebellion, that someone on the Republican side or the Democratic side would put forward a challenge and disqualify them from the ballot. It was written into the Constitution to prevent people who had taken up arms or attacked the U.S. government from holding office. And I I think that that's a pretty fair-minded and legitimate thing to put into the Constitution. And if someone on either side of the aisle had done something like that, I hope that this would come into effect. Several of Trump's rivals were in Iowa campaigning when the ruling came down, each saying that the voters should decide which candidate wins, not the courts. And you see that with the Colorado Supreme Court. I mean, look, if somebody's convicted or something of of some of these things, there was no trial on any of this. They basically just said, what, you can't be on the ballot? I mean, how does that work? What's the limiting principle for that? Uh, Why could could we just say that Biden can't be on the ballot because he let in 8 million illegals uh, into the country and violated the Constitution, which he has? Uh, Could we just say, oh, well, they have uh, money coming to Hunter, whatever. So so I I think the U.S. Supreme Court is going to reverse that. What kind of credence do we take, if any, in the argument that Trump wasn't convicted of insurrection and that we live in a polarized society right now, if it's uh, not black and white as determined by the courts, then why are we running towards this characterized by the folks extreme remedy? Is there any validity? Uh, It doesn't sound like there probably is because this was created for people that weren't convicted of crimes. Um, But I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a valid question um, on the insurrection question. I mean, part of the ruling was that the Colorado Supreme Court found Trump, you know, did uh, engage in insurrection. Now, he hasn't been found guilty in the sense of, you know, like a criminal standard. But I'm I'm not sure that that's actually in the amendment. Uh, I believe it's the Section three of the 14th Amendment in question here. Um, that probably be more of a question for, you know, a legal scholar. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. And then I believe there have been rulings that have found, you know, that Trump engaged in insurrection, even if it, he wasn't convicted of that. So there are some real questions surrounding that. But I also, again, I, I, I don't think that that language is actually in, you know, it, I believe the language is something along the lines of, you know, if someone is as if someone has engaged in insurrection against the U.S., I don't think there's any standard specified there. But yeah, I mean, I agree that that does give 
people who want to defend Trump and opening to say, hey, you know, this is a uh, this is more politics than it is uh, law. And they're kind of ginning this up against Trump. Yeah, I think that it's pretty clear that there's not a conviction requirement in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. If we look back to the circumstances which inspired the writing of the amendment and of the section, we can look at, like we were talking about a minute ago, Southern states electing former Confederates to Congress and Congress refusing to seat those people as members. And the people that they were electing included Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy. He, he was not convicted of any crime. The problem that Congress had and then the drafters of the amendment and the section had was that he was an insurrectionist. That was determined not through the criminal process. And so the very people that the drafters of this had in mind were not convicted. That was the situation that inspired this. Those people were not convicted. I think it's pretty clear that there isn't a conviction requirement. What I'm expecting that the Republicans might try to use as their argument against the application of this is uh, just about the factual claim that Trump has engaged in insurrection or rebellion. I think that that's probably where the substantive argument is going to happen. And the Supreme Court will have to, unless they can find some legal way to avoid it, which they might, uh, they'll have to determine on the merits whether Trump engaged in insurrection or rebellion. And I think that where a lot of the kind of small C conservatives and anti-anti-Trump types are comfortable is saying that, look, what Trump did was wrong, but it's being exaggerated. It's not a threat to the republic in the way that his enemies like to claim. And I expect that that could be the basis under which Roberts, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Barrett might try to refuse to um, hold the determination that's made by the Colorado Supreme Court. But I, I think that this is also kind of wrong. And it's a kind of thinking that I've gotten pretty familiar with because I keep on seeing it in American politics and American political life. I think that there is a bias that a lot of American thinkers have that goes something like, history doesn't happen anymore. Our country is perfectly secure. We don't need to worry about the threats to the republic that we had in the past. And we know that because we can look at the past examples and this doesn't look exactly like that. It's not as serious. It's the idea that, oh, that was the Civil War. And the Civil War was huge armies fighting in uniforms. There were states that had seceded from the Union. It was a formal organized battle like what we saw during the Napoleonic Wars. There's nothing like that going on with Trump. This was just a riot that got out of control. It's not a very big deal. And it, it's the kind of thinking that history happens in other countries and it happens in the past. It doesn't happen here anymore. And I think that this is really wrong, even if we think back to the context of when this was written. Because this wasn't written in the middle of the U.S. Civil War. It was written a few years after. And at that time, there was minor sporadic insurrectionist violence that was continuing to happen that the political leaders at that time were concerned about. Think about the assassination of President Lincoln in 1865. It was one guy as part of a small conspiracy, not part of the Confederate military, committing an act of random violence in Washington, D.C. Isn't that kind of like what happened on January 6th? Think about the Ku Klux Klan and how they became active in the years after the U.S. Civil War. Little militias, not massively organized, pretty small scale, committing acts of random violence against their political enemies, against demographic groups that they had prejudice against in the southern states. Not an army fighting in an organized way. But that's a form of insurrection too, isn't it? That's why the Department of Justice was created, was to protect against the threat that the Ku Klux Klan uh, post to the country. And that's kind of like what happened on January 6th too, isn't it? So these kinds of smaller scale militias and random acts of violence and political agitation that spills over into violence, that can threaten the constitutional order in a way that the people who drafted this certainly would recognize and had in mind. And that sort of violence should be recognized as being insurrectionist in nature, even if people with a very kind of conservative mindset would like to set it aside and say that it can't be as serious as the U.S. Civil War, thus it can't apply. I think we're all on the same page here. We think that there is the possibility that the Supreme Court sides with the Colorado Supreme Court, although it's probably unlikely. So let's do a little hypothetical, a little thought exercise with the both of you gentlemen. I want to look at what we think this ruling 
the impact that this ruling will have on first the GOP primary. Uh, now, I'm going to take uh, the stance that is probably pretty boring, pretty inane. My view is this just cements something we already all knew in that President Trump is probably going to come out the victor of the GOP primary because he's a savant almost at negative campaigning. The negative energy for him in a GOP primary specifically uh, creates a rally around the Trump effect and it solidifies his base. It gets uh, voters that were thinking about looking at other candidates back into the fold. And also it gives him so much media attention that these folks without the name recognition of Trump, which is dominant, like Haley and DeSantis, who probably have pretty good name recognition themselves, they just can't get anything in, in the media. Is this the nail in the coffin for everybody, Aaron? I think the coffin is already pretty much nailed shut. There might be, uh, you know, one nail left to go, so to speak. But, um, you know, I actually, I actually had a, a freelancer who did a piece this week. You know, I had to kind of push back on the, the first draft because um, he was writing very much in the mode of like, you know, the primary is over. This is, you know, just kind of a coronation. Who cares kind of thing. And, you know, there is polling out of New Hampshire uh, this week showing Haley at 29 percent and Trump at 44 percent. So not quite in striking distance, but like, you know, one surge away from kind of, you know, uh, raising some questions about who's going to win there. Um, and, you know, we know how these primaries can work, where if there is some sort of shocking result like that, I mean, in theory, that could generate some momentum for Haley. Maybe that could drive DeSantis out of the race and, you know, the 10 to 15 percent support that he has, uh, maybe even more than that in Iowa, you know, if, if that consolidates behind Haley, then suddenly you have more of a race. But I, I think that's an unlikely scenario. Um, I did get a kick last night out of seeing Vivek Ramaswamy proclaim that in solidarity with Trump, um, if Trump is not on the Colorado primary ballot, he will not be on the, the primary ballot, uh, which is, um, you know, kind of one of those anything but that Vivek, please no moments. Um and then I saw DeSantis actually on TV today basically saying that um, he, he's not going to follow Vivek's lead because doing that would be just caving into the woke left, um, which is a, a very convenient argument for him, <laughs> I think. But, um, you know, so my, my strong hunch is that, yeah, this is pretty much over and that, you know, Trump is going to pretty much clean up and probably win just about every state, if not literally every state. Um, but I will, you know, just kind of throw in that that caveat that New Hampshire is getting a little interesting. And, you know, if Haley can shock the world there, then, of course, you have South Carolina coming up, I believe, pretty soon after that. Right. And that's her home state. So, you know, I can see scenarios. I mean, all we have to do is think back on Joe Biden 2020. And obviously Biden's polling um, was never there was never a candidate who was dominant in the Democratic race like that like Trump is in, the, in this Republican race. So it's, it's not really an apple to apple situation. But, you know, Biden was kind of left for dead early in the primary and then. Uh, you know, Amy Klobuchar and, and these other candidates who dropped out and threw their support, uh, Kamala, you know, and threw their support behind him. And that was enough to at least overcome Bernie, who at one point, you know, had a plurality of support. And so a scenario kind of like that, I don't think is totally off the table. And I don't want to rule that out simply because like as an American, like I would love it if Nikki Haley won the Republican primary. I mean, let, let's have an election where we're not feeling like it's the existential, you know, country on the line. Do I need to get my passport refreshed so I can leave and, you know, take up asylum somewhere else if Trump wins again sort of deal? I mean, I would love it if we had more of a normal campaign where, you know, Biden might lose. And I think a lot of the polling indicates that in a head-to-head -head matchup, Haley would do quite well against him. But at least it wouldn't feel like the, the whole country is on the line. So um, just from that standpoint, I would love it. You know, if she could somehow defeat Trump, I think, you know, his demise in a Republican primary would be delicious to watch as someone who does not support him and thinks that he's a terrible politician and has been very corrosive for the country. But, um, you know, when I kind of take a step back and think through that objectively, I think when you're looking at national polls that show Trump at or above 60 percent, um, that's kind of game over, even if some of these early states are a little bit closer than that. What I would say is that I've seen some of the same polls that you're referring to, Aaron, the New Hampshire polls that show that Haley still is in second place, but is in with the, within striking distance. And, you know, Justin and I are both from New Hampshire, so we're pretty familiar with the state's kind of unique political profile, its demographic makeup and how it's different from other states. And two things that set it apart from other even early primary states are that it has a very high percentage of college educated voters and it has a, a very low percentage of religious voters. I'm pretty sure that New Hampshire is either the first or second lowest state in 
weekly church attendance, the other one being nearby Vermont. Those two states really have very, very few actively religious people. And we know that the kind of white evangelicals have become a big part of Trump's voter base. They're big in some of the other early states. Also, the education polarization is something that we keep on noticing. And that's a real feature of the political landscape of the Trump era. And that there are so many college educated voters in New Hampshire suggests that it should be a weak state for Trump. The other thing is that, just like you said, Aaron, the next state that comes after New Hampshire is South Carolina. And right now, Trump is way ahead in the polls. And that's Haley's home state. So if Haley gets a little bit of momentum out of New Hampshire, and then she loses her home state by dozens and dozens and dozens of points, there goes the momentum. It hits the skids. And Trump is kind of back in the driver's seat again. And I kind of agree with Justin, something Justin alluded to a minute ago, which was about name recognition and how important that is for Trump. And Justin and I have been talking about this on and off for the last few weeks. We've kind of both come to an agreement that the biggest issue in American elections, maybe even global elections, but certainly recent American elections, is name recognition. Aaron, you're talking about Biden, his trajectory in the primary. What did Biden and Trump actually have in common, even though those races were different in a lot of major ways? They were the most well-known candidates. And so a lot of voters who aren't following the race that closely are just familiar with them, and it leads to them getting a little bit more support. And Fox News and the Republican Party tried really hard to get Ron DeSantis close to that level of name recognition, and it just hasn't really worked. And because Trump is so famous and Republican voters have become so polarized, it it makes him hard to take down. But what I would say is this, this news out of Colorado is probably going to boost Trump in the polls and on the Republican side, not in the general election, but on the Republican side. So it will make it even more likely that he could become the nominee. However, it makes the race for second place more important. The fact that this legal challenge, which a lot of people weren't taking too seriously, actually has some real momentum. And there's now a real tangible chance that Trump is going to be determined ineligible to run for president means that even if he gets a temporary boost in the Republican Party, there's now a bigger chance that someone else is going to end up being the Republican nominee. So the race for second place becomes very important because that person is going to be the natural successor to Trump on the ballot if he is determined to be ineligible. So it gives a little bit of hope for Haley and DeSantis and the others that even if they can't actually beat Trump in these early states, in the early primary process, the Supreme Court might say, you're not eligible to run for president, and they'll be there waiting as, hey, I'm the next man down in the primary. I'm the one who's shown that I have the most support now that Trump is gone. And real quick, the reason why this Colorado Supreme Court decision could signal that the second place is is vitally important is because a lot of legal pundits are saying that the Supreme Court's going to split the baby. They're going to hear uh, both the Colorado Supreme Court 14th Amendment case in close succession with Jack Smith's appeal to the Supreme Court on whether or not Trump was immune from potentially causing insurrection. So that's my view is that, yeah, Trump's going to win, but the second place person, if Uh, Jack Smith, who is trying to race to finish this case and get it tried and a verdict, if that all is to happen, uh, you know, before the RNC nominating convention, that would mean very likely that whoever finishes second is able to secure the nomination. Can you imagine at the RNC if they made a move to, you know, Trump wins all these states and then they install someone else as a nominee? Because there's a lot of Trump fans who, you know, I don't think are like traditional Republicans and probably didn't vote very much before Trump or weren't at least committed voters. And so I I can just imagine that being like a debacle for the GOP and their voters kind of revolting against that. Trump just seems in that way kind of bulletproof at this point, right? Where what could he possibly say or do? I mean, he's he's literally on the stump these days, quote, you know, basically quoting Hitler, at least paraphrasing him with this immigrants poisoning the blood stuff of the country. And um, it generates a little bit of news, but like it doesn't really move his polling numbers at all. And you know, I think you're right to point out, John, that him being this, this ruling out of Colorado will, if anything, boost his numbers because that's been the pattern. I mean, the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago and it boosted his numbers. And so um, it's a weird dynamic on the right. I think it makes sense for some of these donors, right, that they're like the, the Coke network getting behind Nikki Haley. And, you know, I think part of the rationale there is to keep someone else alive as an alternative through or at least up until the RNC, just in case, you know, like. 
just in case Trump is convicted or something, um, to have another option. But even with that being said, I can't really imagine that happening because I just think it would cause such chaos. I mean, we saw this in 2016 after the Access, Access Hollywood thing where there was kind of a vibe that Trump's campaign was dead. You know, a lot of people got off the ship. You had people, you know, like Paul Ryan kind of distance, at least briefly distancing themselves from Trump. And, uh, you know, eventually people circled around the wagons and he won. And um, I, I have a hard time imagining that this time would be any different in the sense that they would really ditch him preemptively and install someone else at the top of the ticket. I was in the RNC when the Hollywood Access tape broke. And I just wanted to piggyback off of what you're saying. To a man, to a woman, we were convinced that Mike Pence was going to be, you know, at the top of the ticket after Reince Priebus and everybody else had a conversation, a frank conversation with Trump. We thought that there was going to be momentum building in the powers of center in the GOP to remove Trump. And I mean, if you're going to allow a nominee to be on tape bragging about sexually assaulting uh, women in a week or two before the election, and that's okay with you, I don't think anything is really going to turn you off uh, from Trump. In some ways, the key turning point in all of this was not even exactly Trump related. It was Anthony Weiner when he had this enormous scandal that broke while he was a candidate. And he refused to take his name off the ballot. He said, I'm going to fight through it. I'm not going to quit. I'm sticking around. Because what Priebus and Ryan and people like that at the time that Justin remembers, what they thought they had on their side was a sense of shame that most political figures had until that point, uh, that if something so horrible came out about them, they would step aside. And what you have is just pressure. You can go to them and say, it's over. This is embarrassing. If you want to have a dignified exit from public life, you should just step aside. That was what took down Richard Nixon. He never actually got impeached. He never got convicted. He never got removed. He was never criminally convicted or criminally tried after that either. Uh, but uh, Republican senators, Barry Goldwater being one of them, went to the White House and said, it's time to go. And shame prevailed. But with Trump, shame never prevails because he has no shame. So he will refuse to step aside when horrible things happen and the things get worse and worse and worse. But what he's benefiting from, at least with his voter base, is the boiling frog effect. I think there's still a certain percentage of voters in the Republican primary that have said, I support Trump, but I'll support someone else if he gets convicted of a crime, something like 20%. And those people are crucial. Those are the people that could defect to Haley or DeSantis. And at certain points, that's the percent of the voters that they needed to get over the hump. But what Trump and his side managed to do, at least to their audiences, are continue turning the heat up. And that boiling frog effect, where it, it, which is similar to the slippery slope, you get conditioned to accept gradual increases in intensity. That's helped him carry along no matter how bad things have gotten, at least with his audience, not with the general public, but with his audience. So what these voters would have been shocked about a few years ago, a few months ago, even, they're slowly talking themselves into accepting. And that's what Trump is continuing to count on, that, okay, an indictment, I can convince you to take the indictment and handle the indictment. Uh, but if I get convicted, maybe we'll jump off. All right, now it seems like I'm going to get convicted. Now let's start talking about how you react to that. And what the Republicans are worried about is the same thing that they were worried about in 2015 when he had almost no political support. You know, he didn't have to be on the primary ballot or the primary debate stage ever. That was a decision that was made by the Republican pri uh, Party who hold a private primary process. They, can, they could have eliminated him as a candidate back when he was starting in 2015. And he didn't even have very much political support at the time. When he announced his candidacy, he had 1% or 2%. And then he got up to about 10, 15 by the time the debate started. There were still a lot more people that were supporting other candidates. But what Ryan's Priebus and the Republicans were concerned about was he's got enough voters that if they turn on us, we'd lose a general election when we nominate a different candidate. So we want to make sure those people stick around on the Republican side. 
And that's what they're still worried about today. And that's what they're going to have to be worried about if Trump is kicked off the ballot because of this decision or because of a criminal conviction and, and what that would result in at the convention. They're worried about alienating that core constituency of Trump voters who are now probably 30, 40 percent of the GOP. If those people stay home and you nominate someone else, you lose. Today's PCE data, meanwhile, indicate inflation is slowing, likely cementing rate cuts by the Federal Reserve next year. But this positive data is not helping President Biden's approval rating as he continues to fall behind his GOP rival Donald Trump in the polls. Our very own Rick Newman has been digging through that data. Rick. Yeah, it's just uh, the year is ending poorly for Biden. You just showed a Monmouth University uh, poll result. Um, He's down to 34% approval in that poll. That's the lowest of his presidency so far. And uh, I'm kind of uh, struck by that. Um, You know, he's less popular now than he was in the summer of 2022, which is when gasoline prices hit $5 a gallon and we had the inflation rate hitting uh, its peak of 8.9%, basically all the way up to 9%. A little look forward into 2024 and how we are viewing things right now for the presumptive Trump Biden matchup. So we've we have a lot to discuss. First off, there's Biden's historic record, which I think probably is right up there with anybody since LBJ. You could maybe even argue FDR. I'm not going to name it all, but there's the CHIPS Act. There's the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, withdrawing from Afghanistan, supporting our allies in Ukraine, and so much more. You have those accomplishments juxtaposed with recent polling. And I really don't know how to interpret this polling, but just a couple. From uh, December 18th, there's a Monmouth poll that shows only a 34% approval rate. From a couple days earlier, Wall Street Journal poll shows Biden with a 37% approval rate. Um, And then there was a morning consult poll on December 14th, which had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven swing states with President Trump leading these head-to-head matchups. Uh, by as many as seven points in places like Georgia, 11 points in North Carolina. And and then it gets really concerning because you see him plus five in Nevada, plus four in Michigan. How do we feel about this matchup? Uh, And specifically, how do we feel about the current polling we're seeing despite all of these indictments with Trump? Uh, And then I'm, I'm sure that polling won't be too changed after this Colorado decision. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about it. Um, I think that, you know, Biden, his staunch support for Israel has definitely uh, hurt him, you know, on the left flank of the Democratic Party. Um, and I think one of the big questions heading into next year is as the election becomes more of a binary, although I guess one factor that we could talk about a little bit is, you know, RFK Jr. polling at around like eight to 10 percent. And that's pretty significant and could really affect things. Um but, you know, I do wonder as the, the election becomes more binary, if there is a little bit of a coming home effect where some of these disaffected lefties uh, end up kind of begrudgingly voting for Biden. Although I'll just note kind of anecdotally that the amount of angst I see, um, especially at, on Blue Sky, particularly, which kind of blew my mind today. Um, you know, I, I posted something just kind of questioning the use of genocide in the, con- you know, the term genocide in the context of what's happening in Gaza and like. I ended up having to block, you know, I mean, the the amount of vitriol and just sort of over the top rhetoric surrounding what's happening there and the U.S. is rolling it. Um, It's hard to know if these people are really, you know, Democratic voters or if they're just kind of posturing or, you know, Trump voters who are pretending to be lefties or what's going on there. But, you know, it's it's a very um, animating issue. And I do think that's really done him damage. And when you see his approval rating, you know, with some of the stats that you mentioned at all time lows right now. Um, that is very concerning. Now, the other way to look at it is that there was just a New York Times Siena poll that I think came out yesterday that did not get as much press as some of these other polls that show Trump leading because it showed Biden ahead by a couple points nationally. And, you know, one way of thinking about this as well, you know, with Biden's approval being as low as it is with like this horrible war happening in Gaza, dragging him down that hopefully will be resolved sooner than later in terms of the active combat part of it. Hopefully this is kind of like a low, like kind of his floor and there's upside from here with his approval numbers and the head-to-head matchup with Trump. Um, For reasons that we've talked about, I don't think it's necessarily going to be a great year for Trump next year. I mean, he's going to be 
uh, pre- presumably on trial in D.C. in the January 6th case. Like there's, you know, his court calendar is quite packed. He, he has benefited from the fact that he's posting his unhinged screeds on True Social, with, which very few people are on. And many of them do not get uh, the sort of coverage that he was getting for his post when he was on Twitter. And every journalist in the world was following him. Um, you have to have kind of a, a strong gut these days to be on True Social and reading all that stuff, which I do. But, you know, as people start to pay more attention to him and are kind of reminded of what, you know, 2017 through January 6th, essentially, was like, um, I can't imagine that's going to do him a lot of favors. And I mean, Justin, you you tick through some of the accomplishments. I mean, I think, you know, another thing is we have to kind of think back on January 20th, 2021 and how bad COVID was. I mean, the skillful navigation of the pandemic, getting people vaccinated. Um, the condition, you know, there was over 6% unemployment when Biden took office. It's been under four for many months now, if not even, I think, longer than a year at this point. So um, there's a huge and robust record. The problem is that it hasn't translated to popularity so far. And I don't think anybody really has kind of the silver bullet answer for how to change that. So, I mean, I'm just kind of operating with the assumption that in the United States 2024, with how polarized we are, that it's going to come down. Like, we're going to be sweating out election night. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a landslide. Um, you know, if it was similar to 2020, that's probably, you know, on the the spectrum of like better outcomes in terms of the popular vote and the state breakdown and things like that, the Electoral College, obviously. So, I mean, sadly, we just have to kind of do the best we can to prevent Trump from winning and, you know, to to try to um you know frame the choice between biden and trump appropriately which is you know basically democracy versus some form of authoritarianism if trump wins again i don't feel great about it um i'm not all doom and gloom at this point either and i'm just kind of accepting at this point that come early november we're going to be sweating bullets and not sleeping very much we are not going to be in an election where you're trying to persuade three percent of the electorate, which is historically how pollsters and how campaign folks, the RNC, the DNC, look at these type of uh, elections. Or if you're Steve Bannon, I think he has the two percent line, just trying to flip two percent of voters wins you the election. Um, that's not kind of the environment we're going to be in. So I think that a couple things scare the crap out of me. Number one, we mentioned the approval ratings. We mentioned his accomplishments. But if you go and speak to people out on the street, heck, I'm in Washington, D.C. My roommate is a very intelligent person. We were having a conversation today. He goes, I'm worried Biden's not going to win because he hasn't done anything. (laughs) Well, obviously, Biden has done a lot, right? And he lives in a house uh, with me who's podcasting all the time on political topics. And I have news on and we discuss these things uh, together. So that leads to the larger question, why aren't people able to feel, or if not feel, why aren't they able to vibe with the fact that Biden has accomplished a lot? And I think if we get into that um, recent Monmouth approval poll at 34%, one of the numbers stuck out to me, which was how is Biden doing on jobs and unemployment rate, which Aaron, you ticked off as basically at a historic low, 53% of the, the respondents disapprove with Biden's handling on unemployment. Um, So that leads me to my two concerns. Number one, I think that Biden is older. Um, Whether you've spoken to senior folks uh, that work with him currently or have worked with him uh, to a person, they go, I wish he was 10 years younger. And Trump is very clearly insane. He's suffered a massive cognitive decline. So when comparing to Trump and Biden, Trump has obviously suffered a much more drastic decline. Um, But President Biden, unfortunately, has a stutter. So the speech impediment itself makes him maybe sound or feel older to your voters. And, And we've seen that. His comm shop does not let him get out there and define himself. So you don't have President Biden defining these wins in the media. It's not like when the stock market would reach historic highs and President Trump would be out there bragging, this is due to me. You can all thank me. And and while that is really gauche and gross and grotesque, um, most voters are low information voters. They hear things from friends. They see things from snippets on TikTok. All they see is stock market historic high, funny clip of Trump taking credit. That stuff actually works. Um, So I think that Biden is just incapable, whether it be a strategy or, you know, the circumstances affecting him of really going out there on the stump and defining himself. But also, and this is a quote from an NBC article that the Colorado decision helps Trump. This is the quote. 
They're pissed, said a source with familiar discussions involving senior White House and Biden campaign officials. The decision makes it look like, quote, Colorado is attempting to election interference through non-elected Democratic appointed justices with funding from shady left-wing donors, the source said. Quote, we all hope Biden wakes up on Christmas morning to an A3 story in the Delaware News Journal saying that the Supreme Court ruled 9 nothing in favor of Trump, this person said. So that is that is the view from this unnamed official. And, and I think it holds credence because ultimately, like we've just described, this is going to create a rally around the Trump effect in the primary. It's going to consolidate things. And it's also going to give in Trump's mind, in Trump voters' mind, in some independents' mind, credence to his victimhood of these unelected big money Democrats are trying to subvert the will of the voters by kicking me off through Colorado. I've got something to say about the approval ratings. So we're talking a lot about Biden's approval ratings being low, and they are low. They're in the mid-30s, which by the historical record of American presidents is, is low. Uh, but the way that I've kind of always looked at this, and Justin, you've probably heard me say this before, uh, is that American approval ratings, American attitudes towards the president and the approval ratings that reflect that are getting kind of normalized. They're becoming more similar to peer countries. And that's because American politics is getting more cynical, but this is not unusual. And this is what almost everyone else who's similar to the United States has been dealing with for a while. So if you look at Biden's approval number and what Trump's approval numbers were when he was in office, you say, oh my goodness, this is low. This is much lower than Obama's got to. This is you know, lower than George W. Bush's were for most of his presidency and Bill Clinton. But then when you see it stacked against other countries, you say, oh, actually, Biden's more popular than I realize because you see he's on 35% and then Rishi Sunak is on 19% and Kishida of Japan is on 10% and Emmanuel Macron is on 25% and uh, Schultz of Germany is on 18%. And that's normal in a lot of places for the president or the prime minister, for the executive to be very unpopular. And sometimes it's because of a very low ceiling that any major political figure can get because of a kind of cynicism in the political bloodstream that is increasingly entering ours. So in France, no president of France is getting above 50% and they haven't for decades. Francois Hollande, who is the president who preceded Emmanuel Macron, he got down to 3% approval. That's not 30 or 13. It's three, one, two, three. Can you imagine an American president ever getting that low? And Macron, even though he gets reelected, as he did recently, uh, at the time of his reelection, he was on something like 30% approval, but he was able to benefit from vilification of his uh, rival candidate in that election. And that's kind of the way politics works in a lot of the world. And it's even the way American politics has been working in some contexts until now. So in New York City, you can observe the same effect where the mayor of New York City is always really, really low and they can get reelected, but they're really low and it doesn't get higher than a certain level. In the US Congress, look at congressional approval. It's way lower than the president ever gets and it has been and it's stuck there no matter what Congress does. And they'll reelect Congresses, they'll reelect majorities who they say that they disapprove of. Uh, Mitch McConnell, look at his approval rating and what it was even in elections when he blew his opponent out of the water. He consistently has some of the lowest approval ratings of any U.S. senator. And it's partly because he's a nationally polarized figure. He's the leader and people project everything they dislike about Washington, D.C. and its culture on him. It doesn't mean that he can't win. And he continues to win despite having an approval rating that's in the 20s or something like that. And we're getting here with the presidency. And if you look at what Trump and Biden's presidencies were like, we saw them stay within a pretty thin band in their approval rating. And it's a similar band. It's in between something like 35 and 42. And that's just kind of where the president is probably going to be. And we're, we need to get used to it. We need to adjust our expectations about where the presidential approval rating is going to be. And it's not something that we should welcome because it shows that we're getting more cynical about our politics. You know, seeing the Supreme Court approval rating go in the direction that I'm describing has been very disappointing and concerning, but it is something that almost everyone is experiencing in their politics around the world.
in democratic competitive systems. Um, I think it's also a reflection of what the media environment has become like. You know, this cynicism isn't coming out of thin air. It's a response to a lot of the input that voters and the public are getting. And the media is very different now than what it was 20 years ago. It's even different now than it was 10 years ago or even five years ago. The fragmentation that we're seeing is a absolute disruption of the mid 20th century system where people were getting their news from these consensus driven sources, the network news and a few major newspapers. And we're becoming a little bit more like what we were in the 19th century, uh, where people are getting their news from their unions, their political pamphleteers, the political parties printing their own documents, misinformation going around everywhere. And it's happening even quicker than it did then because of social media. And so it's a very difficult environment to get information out there. And that's part of why misperceptions about the economy and and stuff are going around like wildfire. I mean, you're talking about unemployment. Another one is about energy. I mean, we've seen that in polls. People think that Biden is limiting energy production, even though we're actually at record high energy output for for the U.S. So uh, the stock market is maybe a way that we can beat this now that the stock market is coming back in a more positive direction. Maybe that will help people see the economy in a more positive light because it's a very objective and very easily accessible measurement. You know, everyone can just go on and see what the S&P 500 is today. And that's something a lot of people do because so many Americans do invest. But, you know, there's not that many ways that you can pierce through such a fragmented, difficult media environment and send the same kind of message out to everyone in a way that you could before. So, Aaron, give us something positive to, to take away, because I, I laid out my fears, right, with all of the worst polling number I could find. And we're in the midst of a very contentious war that you said is turning off young people. Well, I mean, another point that I would make that maybe is is kind of positive is that the Trump mega brand is obviously on quite the losing streak these days. And I don't really see why that would change next year. I mean, you go back to 2018 when Republicans got walloped in the House and you know, lost like 40 seats, lost the majority, barely hung on to the Senate. Uh, 2020, we all remember fondly Biden winning, Democrats flipping the Senate in that case. Uh, 2022 is supposed to be a red wave. Dems held on the Senate. And you know, even these off years that we saw this year, uh, we saw Daniel Cameron in Kentucky, who was a big Trump guy, lose to a Democrat. Obviously, Kentucky is a pretty red state. You know, we see the effect of the Dobbs ruling in the, the midterms then last year as well in states like Ohio that are pretty red. So uh, when you kind of look at it that way, um, I don't really see why that would change next year. I think, you know, not only is is the Trump brand kind of a proven political loser at this point. But when you combine that with the effect of Dobbs, um, those are two really significant hurdles for Republicans to overcome next year. So um, I'm kind of holding on to that, you know, as as one data point among a few that I think works in Biden's favor. And, you know, just to reiterate something I said earlier, you know, I do hope that as the war, uh, the Israel Hamas war winds down in Gaza, hopefully very soon, that um, that might reduce some of the disaffection we're seeing on the left with Biden. And one other thing I, I should note um, that I haven't talked about yet is that you know, I think Biden has been very strategic to this point in doing uh, speeches around the country. He was in Milwaukee today, for instance, touting his legislative record and a lot of the accomplishments that he's had uh, during his term in office. But we have not really seen him go negative uh, on Trump or on Republicans. I mean, he'll throw little shots here and there. But, you know, he's trying to get out there and talk about what he's done. Obviously, be somewhat presumptuous of him at this point to talk exclusively about Trump since, you know, not a single vote has been cast in the Republican primary. But again, I do think that when there's more focus uh, on Trump, on his record, on what he's been saying, you know, some of the Nazi rhetoric he's been using, I don't think that's going to help him. So, you know, I think there are factors um, working in Biden's favor. And, you know, I just note again, I mean, the the New York Times Siena poll that came out yesterday showed Biden ahead. So these polls that show Trump ahead, I think, gets a lot of attention for obvious reasons. Uh, But one of the effects that I think that hurts Trump that they have is that they cause reporters to take another fresh look at what a second Trump term would mean. And it's not very good. I mean, they're not things that a lot of kind of normal voters would want. Um, You know, the Atlantic just did a big, big entire issue on what a Trump second term would look like. And it was quite grim. And so when you when you kind of package all these factors together, I do think there are reasons not to wet the bed too much throughout the year, you know, maybe once or twice, but uh, change the sheets, let's forge ahead. And, uh, you know, hopefully when the dust settles next November, uh, we won't have to worry about a second Trump term. 
on social media, there's, you know, debates on whether the economy is actually bad. Uh, is it the vibes that voters are feeling? What's going on? How do we explain this disconnect between the polling, the economy and, and everything else? I think that it really comes down to something simple. And, and I could be wrong. The Republican Party is much more homogeneous, both in the way that a lot of the voters look uh, and think, uh, but also with the way that their elected officials treat Trump. There is an ongoing primary, and most of those folks aren't being too critical of former President Trump. On the Democratic side, at least until it really gets down to the rubber meeting the pavement, you have a party that is heterogeneous, people of all different colors, stripes, ideologies. You have moderates like Manchin. You have far left progressives like uh, folks like um, Cory Bush and so on and so forth. The people that you mentioned who may not be Democratic voters at all that are pretending to be them uh, attacking you. I, I think that a lot of the media perception, in addition to Trump just selling stuff, is due to the fact that Democrats are willing to criticize President Biden much more harshly than any GOP -er would be willing to criticize Trump. We see that with Dean Phillips, who is running a campaign uh, against President Biden. And I think that a lot of the time, these people, these Democratic leaders, these folks in the media, this unnamed campaign and White House source that I read off of from an NBC News article, they're forgetting the simple fact that they aren't all beholden to public opinion. These folks are leaders of their industry, which is politics, the media. They themselves create public opinion. So for folks on the left who are focusing on how negative things are, that's part, potentially part of the problem. And I think that we have seen this cycle after cycle after cycle, Aaron, and all of a sudden at the end of the cycle, everybody's shocked. Oh my God, it didn't turn out this way uh, because at the end of the day, the Democratic base does come home. So I, I do think that a lot of this is bluster. A lot of this is miscalculation by Democratic media and public officials. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I think that um, Biden uh, should be you know, no worse than a coin flip and hopefully much better uh, heading into 2024. I just want to add just two things very quickly. The first is Aaron's point about how the more tangible a second Trump term becomes, the more people are actually looking at what that's going to look like. Uh, the New York Times, The Atlantic, they, they put some effort into trying to spell that out. And a lot of that is about these issues of governance and democracy and the state of the country. The idea of Trump coming back into power, putting in place this purge of the civil service, acting like a dictator in his own words is shocking. But it's also the kitchen table issues, right? I mean, the biggest thing that voters have been complaining about in the economy the last couple of years has been inflation. Trump is running on the basis that prices are too low. His campaign says they want to put a 10% tariff on all imports. So if we look at what a Trump presidency would actually look like economically with the agenda that he's spelling out, we see an even worse direction for the things that have bothered Americans. The, the second thing that I just want to add quickly is that education polarization is giving Democrats a turnout advantage in non-presidential election years. So what we've been seeing from the past couple cycles, you know, the governor races this year and the elections for Congress that happened the year before um, has shown surprising strength for Democrats, something that's a little bit unusual because even during the Obama years, Republicans had a slight edge with college educated voters and were winning a lot of those kinds of races. Uh, so Democrats, because of education polarization, are now overperforming in those contexts. But I think that that's actually a cause for concern for what might happen in the next presidential election, because it makes the turnout very difficult to predict. And if we look at the reasons why Democrats have done well in the turnout model of the last couple of years, we have some reasons to have concern that that can be replicated in a much higher profile presidential election.